Hello and welcome to the Commander's Quarters. I'm your host, Mitch. Glad to have you here. If this is your first time, let me give you a quick rundown on what we're all about. Here at the Commander's Quarters, we build fun and inexpensive focused Commander decks. A focused Commander deck is more attuned than a casual deck, but not quite to the level of a competitive or optimized deck. Commander's Quarters decks are built within a $25 budget. That's $25 for 100 cards. And prices on this show are powered by our sponsor, TCG Player. Before we get started today, though, make sure you go check out our new classic pink playmat and Commander's Quarters t-shirts on thecommandersquarters.com. And thank you to everyone who's already purchased our merchandise. It really does help support the channel. Also, make sure that you subscribe to the channel and click that little bell notification icon so that you can stay up to date on the latest Commander's Quarters episodes. Today's commander is Valduk, Keeper of the Flame. Valduk is a 3-2 human shaman that costs 2 and a red. It says at the beginning of combat on your turn, for each ore and equipment attached to it, create a 3-1 red elemental creature token with trample and haste. Exile those tokens at the beginning of the next end step. So this is a very simple and straightforward commander. The more things that we attach to Valduk, the more tokens that we get. So what's our strategy with this deck? Well, you want to attach a lot of cheap equip cost equipment to Valduk. Valduk does work with equipment and auras, but equipment are a little more resilient, so we're going to be running more of those. And then how do we win with this deck? Well, we're going to overwhelm our opponents with our elementals, or we're going to ping them to death. This is a very fast and aggressive deck, but it can also recover very quickly. If our opponents aren't ready for it, we're going to run them over. As with all Commander's Quarters decks, I'm going to break this deck down into 10 different tactics that show you how the deck works and how you're going to win with it. So let's begin with our first tactic. Tactic number one, start me up. First up, we're going to be running two Mana Rocks that can each tap for a colorless. On top of that, we can pay one to tap and sacrifice Mind Stone to draw a card. And we can pay seven to tap and sacrifice Unstable Obelisk to destroy target permanent. This deck is very low to the ground, so we don't need a lot of mana ramp. But these mana rocks also give us some extra utility in some areas that Red struggles with. Next up, we're going to be running Explorer Scope, which says when equipped creature attacks, look at the top card of your library. If it's a land card, you may put it onto the battlefield tapped. This is a fantastic card in this deck because it does multiple things for us. Not only can it ramp us, but it also can get rid of dead draws off the top of our library. On top of that, it's a cheap piece of equipment that's very easy for us to equip. In this deck, equipment that costs 1 and costs 1 to equip are the sweet spot that we're looking for. And then we're going to be running a different form of ramp with Thermopod. Thermopod allows us to sacrifice a creature to add red to our mana pool. Since all of our elementals that we're creating are going to be exiled at the beginning of the end step, we can just sacrifice them during our second main phase to get some value out of them. This can provide us with a ton of mana in order to actually cast and equip more equipment. And finally, we're going to be running Inspiring Statuary, which says non-artifact spells you cast have improvised. So all of that equipment that's just going to be laying on the battlefield, we can actually use now for mana. We can use this to cast on artifact spells like Thermopod, or to help us get our commander back out if it dies. Inspiring Statuary really allows us to focus on just casting and equipping equipment with our regular mana. But what are some of those pieces of equipment that we're hoping to cast? Let's go through some now in tactic number two, Equip to Handle It. First up, there's Shield of the Realm, which says if a source would deal damage to a equipped creature, prevent two of that damage. One of our top priorities for this deck is to keep Valdek on the battlefield. So any kind of cheap pieces of equipment that we can run to help him stay safe, we're going to be running. On that note, we're going to be running Swiftfoot Boots and Ring of Evo Sile. Swiftfoot Boots will give him Hexproof and Haste, and Ring of Evo Sile will also give him Hexproof if we pay two. For this deck's purposes, Hexproof is a lot better than Shroud because we actually have the target to equip. And finally, we're running Ring of Zathrid, which has pay two, regenerate equipped creature. Even though we have to keep mana up for it, this is another great way for us to protect our commander. Now, since we want to keep our commander safe, generally we're not going to be attacking with him. And if we're going to leave him back to block, we need to make sure that he's not only effective at blocking, but also that he's strong enough to deter attacks. So let's go through some ways to make our commander a little more intimidating in tactic number three. Let's get pumped. First up, we've got Bonesaw, Civic Saber, and Shard of Broken Glass, each of which costs one to equip and is going to give our commander plus one plus zero. Again, the sweet spot that we're aiming for is equipment that costs one and costs one to equip, so Bonesaw is even ahead of the curve on that. Again, the more equipment that we get onto our commander, the more elementals we're going to get. So we want to be as efficient as possible when we're allocating mana for our equipment. So we're also going to be running Silvok Lifestaff, Spectre Shroud, and Captain's Claws. Each of these also costs 1 to equip and gives Valdek plus 1 plus 0. However, they do have some additional benefits too. Silvok Lifestaff has, when equipped creature is put into a graveyard, you gain 3 life. Spectre Shroud has, when equipped creature deals combat damage to a player, that player discards a card from his or her hand. And then Captain's Claws has, when equipped creature attacks, put a 1-1 one, one white core ally creature token onto the battlefield tapped and attacking. Each of these have nice little benefits on top of the power that they give. And although Spectre Shroud and Captain's Claws both are a little more costly, they still only cost 1 to equip. We prefer equipment that costs less to equip because it's going to be easier for us to re-equip it when our commander dies. So we'd much prefer an equipment that costs two and only one to equip versus the other way around. Next up, we're going to be running the Onan Scimitar, Short Sword, and Neglected Heirloom, each of which is going to give a equip creature plus one plus one, and it only costs one to equip. And then there's Bone Splitter, which is going to give a equip creature plus two plus zero. And next up, there's been Riku Gusari, which gives a equip creature plus one plus two and has tap destroy target equipment. So although this does cost two to cast, it can be very effective at removing our opponent's equipment. And then we're going to be running Verdian Claw, which gives a equip creature plus one plus zero in first strike. Sharpen Pitchfork does the exact same thing, except it's plus one plus one. First strike not only helps us with blocking, but also with attacking if we need it to. Next up is Adventuring Gear, which has landfall, so whenever a land enters the battlefield under our control, a quick creature gets plus 2 plus 2 until end of turn. And then Helm of the Gods is going to get plus 1 plus 1 for each enchantment that we control. 
While we aren't running too many ores in this deck, there are a few, and we're also running some other enchantments as well. And finally, there's Ring of Valkus, which is going to give Equip Creature haste, and also at the beginning of your upkeep, put a plus one plus one counter on Equip Creature if it's red. Each of these pieces of equipment depend on certain factors to be more effective. But again, the main thing that we're concerned with is that they're easy for us to cast and they're cheap for us to equip. But what's even better than something that's cheap for us to equip? Let's find out in tactic number four, the best things in life. First up, there's Shuko, which is going to give Equip Creature plus one plus zero. The best part about this card, though, is it costs zero for us to equip. So as soon as Valdek hits the field, we can attach this right to him. It especially helps us get back on our feet after Valdek dies and we recast him. And then we're also going to be running Sai of the Shinobi and Stormrider Rig. Both gives Equip Creature plus one plus one, and whenever a creature enters the battlefield under your control, you may attach it to it. But perhaps the best of these free effects comes from Hero's Blade. It's going to give Equip Creature plus three plus two, and whenever a legendary creature enters the battlefield under your control, you may attach Hero's Blade to it. So if we can get this out on turn 2 and cast our commander on turn 3, it's going to be a 6-4 that creates an elemental right away. Equipment that are free for us to equip not only help us get off to a faster start, but they're also going to help us recover quicker. But unfortunately, there are only so many pieces of free equipment out there. So let's go through some equipment now that might be a little strange, but are still good because they're cheap in tactic number 5, spare parts. First up, there's Blazing Torch, which says, Equip creature can't be blocked by vampires or zombies. It also says that we can tap that creature to sacrifice Blazing Torch, and it's going to deal 2 damage to any target. Now, neither of these effects are particularly relevant, but it's still a good equipment because, again, it costs 1 and it costs 1 to equip. And then we're going to be running Leon and Bullet, which says, Equip creature has tap unattached Leon and Bullet, tap target creature. We can use this to get rid of a blocker or to use it defensively, but again, most of the time it's just going to be an equipment that costs one and costs one to equip. Next up is Heart Piercer Bow, which says whenever equipped creature attacks, Heart Piercer Bow deals one damage to target creature defending player controls. Although this does cost two, it still only costs one to equip. And again, the priority for this deck is to have our equip cost below. And then we're going to be running Echo Circlet, which says equipped creature can block an additional creature. Again, most of the time we're going to be keeping our commander back to block, so this can actually help us. And finally, we've got Sparring Collar, Ring of Thune, and Ring of Colonia, which can all be useful in the right situation. Sparring Collar is going to get first strike, which again is useful for both offense and defense. Ring of Thune gives Vigilance, which allows us to attack with our commander and keep him back for defense too. And Ring of Colonia gives Trample for us to get some extra damage through if we need to. We're running an absurd amount of equipment for this deck, so we're not done quite just yet. So let's go through some more in tactic number 6, the hits keep coming. First up there's Witch's Eye, which says, Equip Creature has, pay 1, tap to scry 1. Although this doesn't help us with card advantage, it does help us get rid of some dead draws off the top of our library. A card that does help us with card advantage, though, is Infiltration Lens. It says, whenever Equip Creature becomes blocked by a creature, you may draw 2 cards. Now, most of the time we're not going to be attacking with Valduk, but there are certain times that we need to. And when we do, this can provide us with some additional value if he's blocked. And finally, we've got Mask of Memory and Rogue's Gloves, which provides value in a different way. Mask of Memory says, whenever a quick creature deals combat damage to a player, you may draw two cards if you do discard a card. And then Rogue's Glove says, whenever a quick creature deals combat damage to a player, you may draw a card. So if we have some ways to give our commander some evasion, these are easy ways for us to draw some extra cards. But these aren't the only ways for us to draw cards with this deck. So let's go through some spells that can help us out in tactic number 7, I Can Dig It. First up, there's Dragon Mantle, which is going to give our creature fire breathing, and it's going to draw us a card when it comes into play. And then Prophetic Ravings is going to give Enchanted Creature Haste and tap, discard a card, draw a card. Neither of these are very powerful, but they do provide us with card draw, and they're cheap for us to cast. Next up is the Flame of Keld, which is a Saga. With the first lore counter, we're going to discard our hand. With the second lore counter, we're going to draw two cards. And then the third lore counter says, if a red source you control would deal damage to a permanent or player this turn, it deals that much damage plus two to that permanent or player instead. Now, while discarding our hand is not ideal, this deck is very good at actually emptying our hand anyway. Drawing two cards is pretty nice, and then if we can get to that third lore counter, we can deal a ton of damage. That additional damage not only helps our elementals, but it also helps our ping effects too. The only downside to this, though, is that our opponents are going to see it coming and can remove it before we get any value from it. If it does stay until the third counter, though, its upside can be huge. And then we're going to be running Tormenting Voice and Wild Guess, each of which make us discard a card, but we get to draw two cards. Cathartic Reunion is very similar. It's going to make us discard two cards, but we get to draw three. Next up, there's Dark Dweller Oracle, which says, Pay one, sacrifice a creature, exile the top card of your library. You may play that card this turn. This card is great at helping us get some extra value out of those elementals, which are just going to be exiled anyways. And finally, there's Culling Deus, which allows us to tap it to sacrifice a creature to put a charge counter on Culling Deus. And then we can pay one to sacrifice Culling Deus to draw a card for each charge counter on it. This is a fantastic way for us to sacrifice a few elementals to draw a few cards. So we've talked about creating an army of elementals that can just swing out at our opponents. But what are some ways that we can get those elementals and our commander through? It's time for us to go on to tactic number eight, breaking and entering. First up, there's Vorak Battlehorns, which says, Equip creature has trample and can't be blocked by more than one creature. This is a great way to not only get some damage through, but also to pretty much ensure that our commander is going to be safe when it attacks. But usually a way for it to be even safer is with Cobbled Wings, which is going to give it flying. This can usually help our commander get through enemy lines when we need it to, but it also helps us with blocking. Next up, we've got two enchantments that can help us get some of our elementals through. Goblin War Drums is going to give all creatures we control menace, so they have to be blocked by at least two creatures. And War Cadence says, pay X and a red. This turn, creatures can't block unless their controller pays X for each blocking creature he or she controls. Both of these are fantastic ways to prevent our opponents from blocking in the way that they want to. 
Finally, we're going to be running Chandra's Ignition, which says target creature you control deals damage equal to its power to each other creature and each opponent. This is a fantastic card for us to cast in our first main phase, targeting our commander. We are running a ton of pump effects in this deck, so we can get our commander's power up to a significant amount. So when we cast this, it can wipe out all of our opponent's creatures and deal a ton of damage to them. This leaves our opponents wide open for our elemental army to come through. But there are other ways that we can best make use out of our elemental army. So let's go through them now in tactic number 9, use every scrap. First up there's Spawning Pit, which says sacrifice a creature, put a charge counter on Spawning Pit. And we can pay 1 to remove 2 charge counters from it to put a 2-2 colorless spawn artifact creature token onto the battlefield. And then there's Tooth and Claw, which says sacrifice 2 creatures, put a 3-1 red beast creature token named Carnivore onto the battlefield. Since our elementals are going to be exiled anyway, these both help us get some extra use out of them. Both are going to give us back half the amount of creatures that we sacrifice with them. This can help us build our army even quicker to help us overwhelm our opponents. And another way to overwhelm our opponents is with Seize the Day. It says, untap target creature, after this main phase there's an additional combat phase followed by an additional main phase. And on top of that it has flashback for 2 in a red so we can cast it again. Since we get an additional combat, our commander is going to create more elementals for us to attack with. Next up is Relentless Assault, which is similar but can be even better depending on how many fire elementals survived. It says, untap all creatures that attack this turn. After this main phase, there's an additional combat phase, followed by an additional main phase. So unlike Seize the Day, it's going to untap all of our creatures instead of just one. And then we're running Throne of the Godfarer, which says, at the beginning of your end step, each opponent loses life equal to the number of tap creatures you control. So the more elementals that survive, the more life our opponents are going to lose. So not only can we make our elementals even more useful with this deck, we can even do the same with our equipment. And that can be seen with a golden pick of this deck, which is the number one card out of the 99. And the golden pick for this deck is Sahili's Directive. It's a sorcery that costs X red red red, but it has Improvise, so we can tap our artifacts to help pay for this spell. It says, reveal the top X cards of your library. You may put any number of artifact cards with converted mana cost X or less from among them onto the battlefield. Then put all cards revealed this way that weren't put onto the battlefield into your graveyard. We're going to have a ton of equipment on the battlefield already, and we can tap each and every single one of those pieces of equipment to add into that X. And the higher we can make that X, the more likely it is that we're going to get more and more pieces of equipment onto the battlefield. With the right setup, this card can heavily swing the game in our favor. The more cards we reveal, the more equipment we're going to get, and the more we can attach to our commander. This card is an absolute game changer that can come out of nowhere, and that's why it's the golden pick of the deck. But these aren't the only explosive cards that can help us finish off our opponents. So let's go through some more in tactic number 10, Power and Ping. First up there's Ogre Battle Driver, which says, Whenever another creature enters the battlefield under your control, that creature gets plus 2 plus 0 and gains haste until end of turn. Essentially this makes all of our elementals into 5 ones instead of 3 ones, and that's a huge jump. And then we're going to be running Berserker's Onslaught, which says attacking creatures you control have double strike. Basically this is just going to double up the amount of damage that our elementals are going to put out. Next up is an even more impactful card with Dragon Throne of Tarkir. It says equip creature has defender and pay 2, tap, other creatures you control gain trample and get plus x plus x until end of turn where x is this creature's power. Again we're running a ton of pump effects with this deck and this can make our elementals absolutely huge. And then there's Impact Tremors which says whenever a creature enters the battlefield under your control, Impact Tremors deals 1 damage to each opponent. And then Warstorm Surge says whenever a creature enters the battlefield under your control it deals damage equal to its power to any target. Both of these are fantastic ways for us to get some additional damage in for just our elementals entering play. Next up there's Hellrider which says whenever a creature you control attacks, Hellrider deals 1 damage to defending player. Again this is a great way for us to get some additional damage out just by attacking. And finally we're running Outpost Siege which when it enters the battlefield we choose either cons or dragons. If we choose cons at the beginning of our upkeep we get to exile the top card of our library and until the end of the turn we can play that card. If we choose dragons, whenever a creature we control leaves the battlefield, Outpost Siege is going to deal 1 damage to our creature or player. Most of the time we're going to be choosing dragons for some additional damage, but if we really need to draw some cards, we're going to choose cons. This deck is a lot of fun and it can deal a ton of damage really quickly. Not only is it aggressive, but it can also recover pretty fast too. But now that we've gone through the cards that help us win with this deck, let's go through the cards that help make it happen. It's time to go on to the mana base. First up, we're going to be running Rogue's Passage, which we can tap for a colorless, or we can pay 4 to tap it so target creature can't be blocked this turn. The rest of our mana base is going to be very simple, we're just going to be running 32 mountains. And now that we've gone through every single card in this deck, let's do a quick price check. A quick reminder that our deck costs are calculated using TCG player optimization, optimizing with even heavily played and damaged cards because those cards need a home too. The average Valduck EDH rec deck is going to set you back $123.06, so let's say we compare to that. Our deck is going to be much more affordable, coming in at $24.96. Again, Commander's Quarters decks are built to be tuned and focused within their budget, but there are always ways that we can improve on them. So let's go through some reasonable upgrades that you can add into the deck, and what I would take out for those cards too. Just a quick disclaimer before we get into this, these reasonable upgrades are going to be completely based off of my own perspective. When you're making choices on how to adjust your deck, you're taking your own playstyle and meta into account. So make sure that you factor that in when it comes to making your own decisions on what to swap in and what to swap out. Now that we're on the same page, let's go through how I personally would upgrade the deck. First up we're going to be adding in Dark Steel Plate which comes in at $5.39. It's an indestructible equipment that costs 3 and it costs 2 to equip and it says equip creature has indestructible. To put this in we're going to take out Sparring Collar. Dark Steel Plate is just hands down one of the best pieces of equipment that can protect our commander. The first cuts that we're going to make with this deck are going to be equipment that don't do much and that cost 2. So Sparring Collar is going to be one of the first things on the chopping block. And then we're going to be adding in Shield of Cauldra which comes in at $4.96. 
For this deck's purposes, it is essentially an exact copy of Darksteel Plate, but it costs 4 and it costs 4 to equip. To put this in, we're going to be taking out Ring of Colonia. Just like Darksteel Plate, this is a fantastic addition to the deck. And again, for its cost, Ring of Colonia doesn't really do much. Next up, let's upgrade this deck with Chaos Warp, which comes in at $2.20. It's an instant that costs 2 and a red, and it says the owner of target permanent shuffles it into their library, then reveals the top card of their library. If it's a permanent card, they put it onto the battlefield. To add Chaos Warp in, we're going to take out Heart Piercer Bow. Chaos Warp is a fantastic addition because Red struggles with dealing with certain permanents without it. And again, Heart Piercer Bow is just an equipment that doesn't do too much outside of being an equipment. And then we're going to be adding in Skull Clamp, which comes in at $4.58. It's an equipment that costs 1 and it costs 1 to equip. It says Equip Creature gets plus 1, minus 1, and whenever Equip Creature dies, draw 2 cards. To put Skull Clamp in, we're going to take out Prophetic Ravings. This is a very easy swap for us because Skull Clamp is one of the best draw effects that we can have with this deck. And Prophetic Ravings doesn't really provide us with any card advantage, it's just looting. Next up, we're going to be adding in Strionic Resonator, which comes in at $3.25. It's an artifact that costs 2, and we can pay 2 to tap it to copy target triggered ability we control, and we can choose new targets for the copy. To add this in, we're going to be taking out Spectre Shroud. Strionic Resonator can copy Validex triggered ability to give us twice as many elementals. 2 mana is a small price for us to pay for such a powerful effect. Like the other equipment that we're moving, Spectre Shroud just doesn't do enough for us at 2 mana. And finally, we're going to be adding in Sundial the Infinite, which costs $2.71. It's an artifact that costs 2 and it has pay 1 and tap it to end the turn. Activate this ability only during your turn. To put this card in, we're going to be taking out the Flame of Keld. This card is fantastic in this deck because it essentially allows us to permanently keep our elementals. And the Flame of Keld can be good in the right situation, but if it's removed too early, it's just going to set us back. And with that, our show is coming to a close, but I really just want to hear about what you think about this deck, so why don't you let me know in the comments below. When you're buying decks like this one, or just individual cards, make sure you use that decklist link in the description below. Not only will you be getting great prices on TCG Player, but you're also going to be supporting this show because they sponsor us. And make sure that you follow us on social media so you can get some early hints on who the next commander just might be. Links to our social media accounts can be found in the description. Also in the description below is a link to the Commander's Quarters Patreon page, and I just want to say a quick thank you to the patrons who have subscribed so far. There are many benefits to being a patron for the Commander's Quarters, including being able to vote on future commanders for deck tacks. There's even a general level tier where you get your own personalized deck tack dedicated to you. I truly couldn't do this without all of your support, so from the bottom of my heart, thank you. If you haven't already, make sure that you like and subscribe to the channel, and then check out some of our playlists on budget commander decks, commander excluded decks, and break the bank episodes. And with that, I'm out of here. Thanks again, and have a good one.